Hey guys. So, in the last video that we did about what do you mean, several people brought up that he throws up his 666 hand signs all the time. So, he always says, I'm a Christian truther, but he just ends up saying right now what his faith is. So, let's, I think it's in the first minute or so. to see this movie initially. This movie, Cabrini, is a historical drama, not my kind of movie, based on the story of a Catholic nun, a Protestant, and it's planned to be released on National Women's Day. So, yeah, I didn't think that I was the intended target audience for this one. So when Angel reached out to me asking if I'd be interested... Angel is representative of the fallen angels. The actual angels that are doing what scripture says, they're still where they're supposed to be at in the firmament. The fallen angels are the ones who are making these movies, okay? He just said that he was Protestant, correct? So this guy right here is talking about Francis Chan is switching from Protestantism to becoming a Catholic. Or I took this out of order. Um, he describes Francis, but since lots of people don't know who Francis is, first I'm going to let Francis speak, and then we're going to go back Francis was part of Bethel and the New Apostolic Reformation and the whole everything that is Freemasonry that's going on. This guy's symbolism, he has lights on each side of his stage, like the two, the, the two pillars in Freemasonry. But let's listen to Francis for a second. I'm going to go back and I'm going to have um, Truth Unedited has a video that explains how not the Catholics not the Protestants, none of those people are actually doing what's inside the scriptures. So that will be the ultimate end of what we're doing. But first, we're going to show the people who are starting to come in to watch the channel from the Bethels and the IHOPs and the different New Apostolic Reformation churches. Just going to tie in Francis real quick. What he has to say. Now, the problem is I have to trust someone's interpretation when I read it whether that's mine with my computer or it's mine with my elders. Yeah. yeah, mine with, you know, and that's what's difficult is we can say Sola Scriptura all day, mm -hmm. but then we still have to read it and explain what it means mm -hmm. and yeah. interpret what it means. And I'm just saying, I don't bet on just me anymore. In every field of study, it is common to see are you saying that your private interpretation of the scripture is superior to 2,000 years of church wisdom? That seems a little arrogant, don't you think? Hello everyone, I'm Joseph Dinesh, a Catholic commentator from Sydney, Australia. If you appreciate the content in the channel, please consider... So this guy is a Catholic, and he is saying that 2,000 years of church history are more important than what Francis Chan's interpretation is. So this guy... Uh, calls Ready to Harvest. His logo looks interesting to me. It's a wheat or a tear. It's one or the other. Um, this says basics of Protestant Christian beliefs. Uh, he basically just does breakdowns of what each denomination and that kind of thing is. He does great breakdowns, but he never goes back to the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Everything stays inside of everything that happened after Constantine kind of stuff. So we're going to let him explain who the Protestants are. I just did air quotes while I was making the video. It, sorry. So I'm just going to do like the first couple. Uh, does it say it's only five minutes long? If it's only five and a half minutes long, you guys can handle that. And then we're going to jump over to Truth Unedited. And I'm going to show you guys how neither the Protestants or the Catholics are the faith that's inside the Bible. Protestant is a slippery term because at the loose end of it, some people will call anything that isn't Catholic or Orthodox Protestant. But most Protestants do put boundaries on the term. So in this video, I'm basically considering what you may call classical Protestantism. For example, Anglican, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Continental Reformed, Methodist, Anabaptist, like Schwarzenegger, Brethren, Mennonites, Amish and Hutterites, Congregationalists, Plymouth, Classical Protestantism. For example, Anglican, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Continental Reformed, Methodist, Anabaptist, like Schwarzenegger, Brethren, Mennonites, Amish, and Hutterites. So, inside this list, it has the Lutherans. That would include Chris Roseborough, 
That would include Michael Long, Long for Truth. That would include Steve Kozar. That would include Doreen Virtue. These are the people that would, I, I'm pretty sure that would probably include Justin uh, Peters. So this list of people include included on this list. Remember that the blind are leading the blind into a ditch. So even though these people can lead you and show you that some of the stuff that's going on in the new apostolic reformation is bad, not one of them is saying to the law and the testimony. The law of Torah and the testimony. If a man doesn't come teaching according to these things, there is no truth in him. There's no daybreak in him. So if these people are Lutherans and they are saying that they are the authoritative voice of it, I, I'm a pastor. I'm ordained. So after I made my video exposing for Tick for being a Freemason, we get fighting for the for the faith who's got 96,000 views on this in two years where he's mocking what I did and explaining that Fertig is bad because he also is bad. So this is Chris Roseboro. See how Chris Roseboro put Stephen's hush symbology in front of you? You know... <laughs> This generation is waiting for to what to restore the hope of a nation. Now, I'm a pastor, I'm ordained, and um, I've never seen in Scripture that command that I'm supposed to, you know, restore the hope of a nation. I mean, that so this Protestant is using this Cairo that is a Templar logo, and he's flying this Cairo in front of you. He's calling himself Christian pirate the pirates with the skull and crossbones were freemasons the templars with the red crosses on their ships were freemasons this is just a group of right-hand path cabalists against left-hand path cabalists this guy is still he's an ordained protestant have you guys seen the symbol the symbology that's inside that cult the church that Chris is connected to is still wearing collars, correct? I don't have to argue with you guys over that. That should be enough to just be able to put him inside a category based on his belief still is coming through the Catholic line. So this guy who's using Freemason logos and telling 96,000 people not to use the symbolism inside Stephen Furtick's church to be able to identify who Stephen Furtick is as a Freemason, Roseboro is also using the Freemason symbols. So Roseboro is inside the Lutherans, inside this list. Congregationalists, Plymouth Brethren, Disciples of Christ, and Pietists. Church of Christ and Baptists also will fit in the general description I'm about to... Give, though they don't always accept the Protestant label. Other groups you might not call classical Protestants, but they will also fit with the beliefs mentioned in this video, are most non-denominational churches, Pentecostals, not including oneness, and third wave charismatic churches. Groups outside this list may not... That includes Baptists so far. All the Calvary chapels were just listed as the non-denominational, and the uh, Pentecostals, which includes the entire New Apostolic Reformation. All the Freemason pastors that keep popping up inside those three so far that we're very, very aware of. 
say with everything I say here, though they will agree with much of it. Who am I talking about? For example, Unitarians, Jehovah's Witnesses, Latter-day Saints, Seventh-day Adventists, and of course, Catholics and Orthodox too. And I'm generalizing. Okay, so Jehovah's Witnesses, we already have a video about them being uh, more uh, Masons. There's La the Latter-day Saints are Masons and Seventh-day Adventists are Masons. The Within the churches I've mentioned where they may disagree with something I'm listing as basic Protestant beliefs. So what are some general basic Protestant Christian beliefs? Notice that I'll be intentionally vague on some details. Each Protestant group will have more precision on the details, but they don't all head the same direction with their precision. Here are the beliefs. There is only one God. God is eternally in three persons, the Father, the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. God is the creator of all things, including humanity, and he made humanity very good, but humans sinned, and today humans are born with a sin nature. God the Son, who has existed since eternity past, became a human and was born of a virgin. Jesus lived a sinless life, the only person to have ever done so, and he performed miracles while on this earth. To solve the problem of mankind's sin, he died on a cross, and to prove his victory over sin, he was bodily raised to life again by God the Father. Humanity without Jesus is dead in their sins and will ultimately die in this life and suffer eternal death in a lake of fire. However, Jesus has promised that any person who believes in him and what he did on the cross will be freed from their sin. They will be given eternal life and will be raised from the dead to be with Christ forever. Jesus said he would build his church and he commissioned those who follow him to tell others about the good news of his death for the sin of the world, his burial and resurrection, which is called the gospel. He told the church to baptize and to observe the Lord's Supper. Not long after Christ's resurrection, he ascended bodily into heaven where he is alive today, but he also sent the Holy Spirit as a comforter to those who believe in him and to guide them into all truth. Christ promised that he will one day return and there will ultimately at the end of this world be a final judgment day. Christ affirmed the scriptures and later at a time following Christ's ascension, the Bible was completed. Both Old and New Testament scriptures were compiled together into the Bible we have today. There are 66 books that are inspired canon. Certain things in the Bible were instructed only to certain people while other things are for all of us to observe. Jesus Christ fulfilled the Old Testament law and so certain things it required such as animal sacrifices are no longer necessary. Churches meet together on the first day of the week for things like recitation and preaching of the scriptures, singing, observing baptism in the Lord's Supper, prayer, and spending time with those in the church, the brethren. By exception, certain things that Catholics practice or believe are not generally accepted by Protestants. Though there are varying views on Christ's presence in communion, the Catholic view that the elements change into the body and blood of Christ is not typically accepted. That Mary, mother of Jesus, was assumed bodily into heaven, or that she was immaculately conceived without original sin are not taught. Salvation is received by grace through faith alone, without any necessary works. Although within the church there can be various authorities and teachings, such as leadership and in some cases reason, experience, and tradition, any point of required doctrine in the end must rest on the scripture. Therefore, the Bible is the sole final authority, a doctrine called sola scriptura. Though not every Protestant denomination even has clergy, when they do, there is not a requirement of clerical celibacy. And not only do Protestants reject the authority of the Catholic Pope, they don't have a single figure at the top who has the ability to infallibly declare doctrine. Protestants also don't teach in purgatory or limbo, and prayers are only directly to Jesus not requesting saints or Mary or angels or anyone else who has died to intercede for them. A few concluding thoughts. Some Protestant denominations have begun to set aside some of these teachings. For example, belief in a literal hell. Theologically liberal denominations may not teach it. For more info on that, watch my video on theological liberalism versus theological conservatism. And secondly, what I've given here is not the way that you would hear people in these denominations present this because they would be adding in details that other denominations would disagree with. This is the stripped down version that can mostly be agreed upon. Finally, there are a few exceptions to what I've said. For example, some Anglicans do request intercession from the saints or Mary, and Protestant teaching on atonement has enough variance that what I have said may be just a bit off for one church or another. But that's the nature of generalizing, and beyond this, individual members or even pastors may introduce a practice in their church that the denomination doesn't teach or is even opposed to. With this understanding of basic Protestant Christian beliefs, you may be interested in things that make denominations different. This whole channel is about those differences. Subscribe and click over here to watch the latest. If you watch this part of the series, part 59, we went through the events of the 2nd to 4th century AD, the time after the first apostles had all died and the church was building and spreading without them. We saw that the church growing in Rome at that time was an unauthorized religion that suffered from persecution and there was a clash between the pagans and the newfound Christians. We had to go through that history in order to set the stage for the next important events. A topic of extreme importance due to the massive amount of confusion that surrounds it. But before we go any further, I want to address an issue that seems to be a stumbling block for many in the comment section. What that is, is my use of the label of Christians and Christianity. As we go through history, these labels will be used to classify the faith of belief in Yahshua the Messiah. 
Now, I understand that because of the hypocrisy of the Christian church today, along with the lies and paragraph by the Roman Catholic Church that we will soon see, and for many other reasons, too many to discuss, this label is something that is frowned upon. And I personally understand those that hold this view. The early apostles did not call themselves Christians, and the belief was not labeled Christianity. The early apostles were more referred to as the Quotashim, or the set-apart ones, and the belief was known as the way. Sometimes, someone without this understanding would ask me, are you a Christian? And because I understand what they're implying, basically, they're asking, am I a believer in salvation through Yahshua the Messiah? I tell them yes, because it is sometimes easier to meet people where they are rather than confuse them and lose them. And this is why you hear these labels. There are many that have this understanding, but there are many that do not. The goal of this channel is to educate so that even a child would understand. So I am meeting the majority where they are. What I ask is that those that do not use this label don't make it an issue that distracts others from the overall message of these videos. I hope that makes sense, and I thank you for your understanding. Now let's move on. There is a severe danger and problem within the church, and that is the sermon. Because the church doesn't completely understand their enemy, now for those that still do not understand, please watch part five of this History of Religion series, and your enemy will be explained to you. But like I was saying, because many in the church do not completely understand the enemy, many are deceived by wolves in sheep clothing just because they say they believe in Jesus or they call themselves a Christian or are co-signed by other Christians. The devil deceives the masses through perpetrators that claim the faith but don't really fully believe or who are intentionally seeking to deceive the church. So for example, Beyonce can go on stage half naked, wind up her body, and then the next day sing a gospel song and people believe she's a Christian. Or Donald Trump can call himself a Christian and other pastors co-sign him so others truly believe he is a Christian, even though the day before he would send the mother of all bombs on another population. The point I'm making is that because the church is not using much discernment, when someone popular comes in Jesus' name, they are often deceived by them. When this is done by a majority, this can severely hurt the church. There's also a flip side to this. That deception that I just spoke of is something that takes place within the body of Messiah. But the other side of that deception comes from those that reject the belief in Yahshua altogether because they see the hypocrisy and the lies that are put in place by these perpetrators. And they decide to place it all together and call the whole thing a lie, not knowing enough to just remove the deceivers and go down to the foundation of truth. This is not a problem that happened a few years ago. This is something that has happened since the early years of our faith. And depending on how important the perpetrator was, the bigger the lie and deception becomes. And that's pretty much a summary of this major topic in the world. Someone who came in the name of Jesus, placed himself as a true believer of the faith, was co-signed by other leaders in the faith, and through him placed the world in massive confusion still to this day, almost 1,700 years later. The person I'm talking about is Emperor Constantine of Rome. Constantine is blamed for many things. People say, Constantine created that Bible you're reading. Or, Constantine created Christianity at the Council of Nicaea. Look it up. And many other things. Today, he will be discussed, and Elohim willing, understanding will be given. Let's begin. So before we go into Constantine... It's important to understand the Rome he was ruling first. In the beginning of the third century, after the death of Emperor Commodus, yes, this was the emperor that they depicted in the movie Gladiator. When Emperor Commodus died, Rome went into civil war. And after the victor of that civil war, Septimus Severus, died in year 211, over the next 40 years, there were 12 official emperors, and not one of them died peacefully in their bed. Many of the wealthy senatorial families who held ancient Republican offices, who governed the provinces and commanded the armies, were killed off or ruined in the frequent changes of emperors. Rome was also under constant threat of foreign invasion, and the maintenance of the army was stressing the Roman economy. Rome was a mess. All these factors seemed to shrink the Roman population from the late 3rd century on, and the dominance of Rome was in question. 
late third century on, and the dominance of Rome was in question. In the year 284, Valerius Diocles was claimed emperor under the name Diocletian. Diocletian recognized the need for expanding the ruling class to govern an empire beyond the control of just one single individual. Basically, he realized he needed help if he was going to be able to rule properly. So he named Maximian a senior emperor of the West, and he ruled the East. In the year 293, he further expanded his administration by naming Constantius Chlorus as junior emperor of the West, and a man named Galerius as Caesar for the East. Now, Constantius was the father of the future emperor Constantine. So the Roman Empire remained a legal whole, but was divided by East and West for administrative purposes. This is how the division was. There was an East and West part of the empire. Now, like we spoke about in part 59, the church was growing. The Christians were their own community, and they refused to worship the gods of their neighbors, regarding them as demonical forces. They avoided the spectacles in the theaters and the athletic contests like the gladiators held in honor of the gods. They were wary of even dining out in an age when most meat for sale had come from the temple sacrifices. They avoided military and civil service because those roles involved oaths and duties that conflicted with their faith. All of this avoidance of customs regarded by their pagan neighbors as normal soon earned them a reputation as enemies of the human race. Does that sound familiar today? The refusal of the Christians to swear allegiance to the gods of the state and to a divine emperor raised suspicion from the Roman government about the political loyalty of the church. In the eyes of the pagan masses, they believed the Christians were atheists who did not worship the traditional gods. In the year 303, Diocletian and a Caesar of the East, Galerius, ordered Christians to surrender their sacred books and their churches were to be destroyed, and they severely persecuted the Christians. So in the year 305, Diocletian was in bad health and he abdicated, resigned, with his senior Caesar of the West, Maximian. Constantius Chlorus, again, Constantine's father, became the new Caesar of the West, and Galerius was the Caesar of the East. Now, Constantius of the West is said to not have enforced the persecution of the Christians after Diocletian's abdication, but Galerius, a strong pagan, felt strongly about it. Now, understand this about Constantine. He grew up and was educated in the Eastern Empire under Galerius, who, like I said, was very much a pagan. He was taught and brought up as a pagan. His father worshipped the pagan deities, as so did he. He joined his father shortly after Diocletian resigned. In the year 306, Constantine's father died at York in Britain, and the legions there claimed Constantine their new Caesar, but this was not recognized outside of Britain. Galerius, pronounced Valerius Severus, also known as Severus II, as Caesar of the West, passing right over Constantine. Constantine then threw himself into a complex series of civil wars in which Maxentius, the son of retired emperor Maximian, rebelled at Rome with his father's help. Maxentius defeated and executed Severus, again, who had been proclaimed Western Emperor by Galerius. After Severus was defeated, Galerius made Licinius Caesar of the West, and the remainder of the West was still divided between Constantine and Maxentius. I told you it was complex. So there was a civil war for control of the Western Roman Empire. And this is the history up to the point of Constantine's complete rise to power. So that was a lot of history. A lot of people are told of Constantine, but do not know much more than the Council of Nicaea part. This history needs to be understood so that you can understand the decisions he made. The control he wanted over the western part of the empire was being challenged by two other opponents. And internally, the persecution of Christians was establishing them as their own community, creating conflicts throughout the empire that also threatened to tear the Roman Empire into two. And the classic structure of the Roman Empire was beginning to crumble with the lack of leadership and lack of loyalty to the government and failing military. Basically, 
Rome was in a mess and it was on its way to total collapse. So what it needed was new purpose and unity. And when understanding Constantine, this should be at the foundation of understanding all of his moves as emperor. Now, in the year 312, Maxentius prepared to move against Constantine and Licinius to make himself master of the West. As Constantine moved toward battle with Maxentius at the Milvian Bridge outside of Rome, he is claimed to have gone through some sort of religious experience. Eusebius tells of a vision seen by Constantine in which the Christian sign of a cross appeared in the sky with the legend saying, In hoc signu vine, or in this sign, conquer. So he had the cross put on his legion's shields. He easily defeated Maxentius, who fled back to Rome. But before reaching the city, Maxentius fell into the river and drowned. His body was discovered the next morning among the corpses of many others. This victory was a turning point in history. There would now be a fusion of church and state. Constantine became emperor of the West, and Licinius took over the East. It is said that Constantine believed wholeheartedly that he had won the West through the mercy of the Christian God. And from this vision that Constantine had, the world changes. Now, I will not speak about what was in his heart, but based upon this vision, it is clear that this sign did not come from Yahweh. In this sign, conquer, it goes against the whole purpose of Yahshua and is contradictory to the many teachings Yahshua has told us about the coming of the kingdom of Elohim. He did not want the world to be conquered through the sign, and he did not want nor need man to conquer the world for him. So it is clear that this vision was not from him. He was not a true believer. He was a pagan emperor. And make sure you explain it to anybody that says this. Yahshua did not want the world to be conquered through the sign of the cross, and he did not want nor need man to conquer the world for him. Whether Constantine was genuine or not does not matter, because the vision was deception. And as we go through history, we see what that vision truly meant. Constantine took it as using the cross as what he needed to do to subdue his enemies and gain power at that time. But this vision really represented what the Roman Catholic Church, which was established through Constantine, would actually do throughout history. The Bishop of Rome, His Holiness, Pope Pontius. Your Holiness. Philip. As the Apostle said, there is no power but of God, and the powers that be are ordained of God. And who is to speak for God if not I, his vicar on earth? And so, I declare that submission on the part of every man, be he serf, or royal counselor, or king, Submission to the Bishop of Rome is absolutely necessary for his salvation. To put it simply, submit or be damned. Now, we will cover the Roman Catholic Church in depth in an upcoming part of this series, so I will not get ahead of myself. The beginning of the Roman Catholic Church is very vague in its history. The Catholics did not start because of Constantine. They were already established well before, and you can tell through the writings of the early church fathers from Rome. But they were solidified as a group because of Constantine. So, before we go any further, when understanding the history of the church and the history of the faith, there must be understanding that takes place. So let me illustrate to you what is truly going to happen using our current times as an example. Today, there are believers in Yahshua who actually follow his words. They stay on the narrow path and they reject the influence that the world has tried to have on the faith. Many of whom who watch these videos and support this channel. There is a true remnant of the Messiah, the true bride that actually places the Father's will as the priority over everything else. This is the true church. Those that truly follow and practice the way. Now there is also a very general brand of Christianity. This can include many different denominations and the very liberal churches that integrate the world into their way of worship. Now, as the world is concerned, they view it all the same. They view it very generally as Christians, those who believe in Jesus. And this is why people like to distance themselves from the label of Christians, like I spoke about in the beginning of this video. 
because they want to be set apart from that label. But the true bride, those that walk the narrow path, know there is separation. They know that there's differences. They know there will be wheat and tares. Now, if history was written today, you would not see the true bride, those that follow the way and reject the ways of this world. You would not see us separated in history and spoken about unless there was a major event that clearly separated us from the general view of the church. But if someone of today was writing history, we would not be in that history. Now, of course, we were still here and we were very important to the faith. But history would just talk about the general faith of Christianity and maybe separate it by denominations. Does that make sense? This is what you will see as we discuss the history of the church for now on. Much of the history of the church for now is really discussing the Roman Catholic Church. When the Roman Catholic Church gains power and comes on the scene, there is a major split in doctrine that takes place. The true believers of the faith, those that rejected the new doctrines of the church, are not written about in depth through history. That doesn't mean that they weren't there. It just means that history did not care about them and record their objections, just like history doesn't care about us today. So as history continues, there is a change in who is truly being discussed. And that is why there is so much confusion. The majority just tie it all together. They look at it as, if history says Christians, then it must refer to the complete faith altogether. But that's not true. Back in these times of Constantine, there are those that rejected the things that Constantine did. But they were not the dominant force of the time. And they wouldn't be, because this was not how Yahshua prophesied the coming of the kingdom of Elohim. For anyone to understand the difference in those that are true believers of the faith and those that are the perpetrators, or more clearly, those that are the wheat and those that are the tares, you must know and understand scripture. You must know the word of Elohim. And then the differences become a lot more clear. Now, I will get back into Constantine in a few, but I want to illustrate my point through scripture and what Yahshua had to say, because in the end, that's all that matters. Yahshua tells us about this, that this would happen in his parable of the wheat and tares. I spoke about this in depth in part 22 of this series. It's found in Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 through 30. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, First, gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. He then explains this parable in the same chapter, verses 36 to 43. So when the disciples asked him to explain that parable, he answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let them hear. I mean, it's remarkable. The father sold his church in the world, and the enemy came and decided to sow his deceivers amongst the church. The thing is that, at first glance, the deceivers can look like the church. The tares are the counterfeit, who look and act like believers, but in the end, they don't produce righteous fruit. 
all of these different doctrines, all of these false traditions, all these believers who say they love him, but side with the world more than they ever cared about him. What we witnessed from part two of the series up until part 57 was a father planting his good seeds in the field of the world. Now what we are witnessing is the devil now planting his tares. So as we go through this history, you must understand the difference and not let the tares confuse you. Yahshua did not grow his church through physical power or forced conversion. In that same chapter, Matthew chapter 13, verse 33, Yahshua says, The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was all leavened. All leavened. Think about a woman baking bread. She kneads the dough and then puts it away until later the yeast has raised the dough tremendously. He is saying that this is how the kingdom of heaven is. The leaven or yeast will grow internally through its own power, which in the case of the kingdom of heaven is the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of heaven, those of us who will inherit it, are growing the numbers in the kingdom internally by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not by forced conversion or requirement to be a part of the church as the Roman Catholic Church did. And this is how we see Constantine took that vision of the cross to mean. In that sign, he conquered. Through the cross, the Roman Catholic Church conquered the world. This vision of Constantine just planted more tares. And it's important that we as a church are able to see this and communicate it to others that want to present Constantine as a creator and solidifier of our faith. Because he was not. He used our faith for political gain and military conquest and made a complete break with Rome's past, spiritually and physically. But he was not the creator of our faith. He contradicted it. Let's get back into more understanding of him. So Constantine became the emperor of the West in the year 312. In the year 313, he and co-emperor of the East, let's say... Hmm. That's awfully interesting. That's that same Cairo that Chris Roseboro uses. Bum, bum, bum. Yes. Standing of him. So Constantine became the emperor of the West in the year 312. In the year 313, he and co-emperor of the East, Licinius, proclaimed religious toleration throughout the empire through the Edict of Milan. This legalized Christianity and allowed for freedom of worship of whatever God you chose throughout the empire. Constantine was not baptized until on his deathbed, and he retained until his death the pagan title Pontifex Maximus. He also still allowed pagan symbolism of Sol Invictus and Mars on his coins up until the year 320. So this obviously was not a pure conversion of faith. He started making large contributions to the church in Africa, and at Rome had begun a series of great churches. He donated to the Bishop of Rome, a role that is later called the Pope, the Lateran Palace, which was the imperial property of the Lateran, where a new cathedral, the Basilica Constantinia, now San Giovanni Laterano, soon rose. The Church of St. Sebastian was also probably begun at this time. And it was in these early years of his reign that Constantine began issuing laws to vang upon the church and his clergy fiscal and legal privileges and immunities from civic burdens. At Rome, the Church of St. Peter was begun. In the Wait a minute. Did you guys just hear that Constantine's the first one to set up the church's 501c3? upon the church and his clergy fiscal and legal privileges and immunities from civic burdens at Rome and it was in these early years of his reign that Constantine began issuing laws to vang upon the church and his clergy fiscal and legal privileges and immunities from civic burdens at Rome the church of St. Peter was begun in the later 320s it was lavishly endowed by Constantine also churches at Trier Aquilia, Serta, and Numidia, Nicomedia, Antioch, Gaza, 
Alexandria and elsewhere owed their development directly or indirectly to Constantine's interests. He declared the first day of the week as the Sabbath, the day of rest, since he deemed it both the day of the Messiah's resurrection and the day sacred to the sun, which is why it is called Sunday, and is the reason why churches to this day gather and worship on Sunday. Constantine tolerated certain pagan religious practices, but pagan sacrifices were forbidden. Temple treasures were seized. Gladiator contests ended. Crucifixions were abolished. And laws were enacted against sexual immorality and ritual prostitution. Over the next few years, Licinius's attitude towards the Christians changed with both executions and the destruction of several Christian churches. This was enough to prompt Constantine to gather an army and defeat Licinius in a second battle at Hadrianopolis. In the year 324, Licinius was defeated and surrendered by Constantine. Licinius hoped to return to life as a private citizen, which Constantine initially granted. But he went back on his word, and Licinius was hanged in 325. Even his nine-year-old son was killed. This victory of Constantine's reunited the empire. He now had control of both the East and West empires of Rome. In the same year, he officially declared himself a Christian and made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. And from here, we have the true beginning of the power of the Roman Catholic Church. He will then call for the Council of Nicaea in the next year, 325. And this event also brings along massive confusion. We will discuss it by itself in the next part. But Constantine was a major agent of change of world history. He took pagan Rome and changed the classification of his religion. This was never what Yahshua ever intended for the church, and this is not his church. The conversion was not pure and genuine, and it contradicts the word. But the Roman Empire was so vast, and when it fell, the Roman Catholic Church took over as an organization of power. The church was rebranded and relabeled. Its purpose very different from the true purpose of Yahshua, but it grew under the same name and label which brings so much confusion. So we are now at a point in time when people don't know what the Bible says, but then they also know of the contradictions of Constantine, and they use Constantine to discredit the true faith in Yahshua. It should not be grouped or classified together in any way. What happens with Constantine is a planting of tares, and you should never identify pure faith in Yahshua with any of the actions he did. History can be confusing, when we do not have all the facts, and then we isolate points to justify our already held opinion. Now that Constantine has been explained in depth, when someone brings you a misconception about him and his effect on the church, you will probably have more of an understanding than they do. And now you can use that understanding to correct and teach them in love. The church that Constantine created was not the church. You are the church. And our history isn't one that will get the attention of historians unless they are speaking of our persecution. The church is not built out of power of organizations and not built by money created by the wicked. The church is built by the power of the Holy Spirit and through us that yield to him. So continue to do the will of Elohim so that others can know him too and be loose from the bondage of the lies of the enemy. The time of acceptance of lies and false truths is over. Be blessed. Okay, thanks for watching. If this is Blessed Jesus, part 62, we discussed the Roman Catholic Church. We went through some of the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church as discussed through the catechisms. We saw that the Catholic Church places tradition and scripture in the same regard. We understood there were many different doctrines that did not fully align with the word of Elohim. Now, as we move past the understanding of the Catholic Church, we will see a lot more division within the Church. We will see the Roman Catholic Church break apart and the Eastern Orthodox Church forms. And much later, we see a Protestant Reformation that also breaks away from the Roman Catholic Church. And then we see different denominations within the Protestant churches. As history continues, there is a constant theme of confusion and division that we will see. The thing about it is if you understand the enemy, you clearly see that this is his goal. The more confusion and division within the church, the weaker the church becomes. 
And in order for him to be worshipped by all, even those who believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he needed to infiltrate, deceive, and spread division. And today, we are looking at a comprehensive result of centuries of manipulation, deception, and division. One of the biggest parts of the deception is with the simple concept of what the church is. Today, most believers don't even ask me if I believe in Yahshua the Messiah, who the world has translated to Jesus Christ. They don't ask me much of what I believe, or even if I'm a believer. The biggest question I get is, do you go to church? Or, what church do you go to? Or, I had a friend that believed that he was saving souls by bringing people to church but he never introduced the people to the gospel. He just spent most of his time introducing them to his church organization. The point I'm getting at is that most people don't understand the simple concept of what the church is. And before we discuss any more about the history of religion that consists of different subjects, like the different denominations, I want to dedicate some time to talk about what the church is in an attempt to bring much needed clarity. When I was brought up, I was made to believe that church was somewhere that you went to praise Elohim. I knew there was a lot of them, but I just believed that there were a lot of different ones to take care of the many different type of people in the world. Some black churches, white churches, Jamaican churches, etc. But I just believed that the church was a place you go to on Sundays and some holidays to worship Elohim. But as I began seeking Elohim on my own through his word, it was clear to me that what I believed the church was didn't fully align with scripture. What I knew church to be was more of the tradition and evolution of the church, but it was not in fact what Yahshua calls his bride. So what we need to do is first discuss what the church is. Not by tradition, what man has taught us it is, but what the word of Elohim says. Let's begin. Yahshua first mentions the church in Matthew chapter 16, verse 15 through 18, when he says to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living Elohim. Yahshua answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who was in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You see, in this, he was not saying that he built his church on Peter, but on that confession, that he is the Messiah, the son of the living Elohim. And on that truth, the foundation of his assembly is built. Assembly is a better translation for church. After his ascension, in the book of Acts, chapter 2, we see the beginning of the church. After many repented and were baptized in the name of Yahshua, Acts chapter 2, verse 47 says, The Adun added to the church daily those who were being saved. It never mentioned a building or an organization. And like I just said, a better translation would be assembly. What I am getting at is that the church is not a place that we go to, but it is something that we as believers are. We do not go to church. Once we accept Yahshua as our master and savior, we become part of his church. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, Yahshua said, where two or three are gathered together in his name, he is there in the midst of them. That's because we are his assembly. We can be anywhere and be his church. In his letter to the Ephesians, in the first chapter, verse 22 and 23, Paul says, and he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. He is not talking about one local assembly, but about all believers. He says that we are the Messiah's body. That's why we say we are the body of Messiah, the body of Christ. In verse 25 of chapter 5 of Ephesians, Paul says, the Messiah also loved the church and gave himself for her. A few verses before that, in verse 23, he says that the Messiah is the head of the church and the church is subject to him. So from these verses, we know that the church is the assembly of people that believe that Yahshua is the Messiah, the son of the living Elohim. 
those that have repented and have been baptized are added to this assembly, and anywhere two or three are gathered together in his name, he is in the midst of them. The church is his body, and he gave himself for her. The Messiah is the head of the church, and the church is subject to him. Through scripture, this is what the church is. It's not a building or an organization. It's the collective group of believers in Yahshua all over the world. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27 says, Now you are the body of Messiah and members individually. The church is who we are, not where we go. Like Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 18, For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. You see, they came together as a church. They did not go to the church. The early church was quite different than what we know as the church today. The first thing is that they met privately in each other's homes. This was the norm. They all joined together. They sold their possessions and divided them up amongst each other. Acts chapter 2, verses 44 through 46 say, Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possession and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 19, Paul says, The churches of Asia greet you. Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Adun, with the church that is in their house. The churches were not organizations within the state, but just the collective group of believers in the town. So as Paul went out through his many missionary journeys, as people believed in the towns that he would visit, those towns would have its own church. But it was not a building or organization. It was a collective group of believers in that city. So fast forward today. If you ask someone what church was, none of those characteristics would be how church was described. What do you think an ordinary 18-year-old of today would say churches? I think there will be a lot they may want to say, but keeping it simple, I think they would say it's a place where Christians go on Sundays to worship God. Church today is characterized more as an activity, a building, or an organization rather than a role that is filled through people, rather than a classification of people. A building is not a church. It is just a structure that can contain the church. Like I said before, the early church did not meet in official buildings. The early churches were home churches. They met in each other's homes. But though they had separate places they communed at, they all considered themselves one church. You can see that through much of the Apostle Paul's letters. When there was division, he called it out, because there was not to be any division. Before Constantine, there were no church buildings or cathedrals. In fact, the real church building of cathedrals didn't really start until the 11th century. What we know today as church is a mix of scripture with tradition. This is not surprising if we go back to the last part of the series, part 62. We see that the Roman Catholic Church believes in both scripture and tradition. They are the primary influence of the tradition that we have as church today. This is where we get many of the traditions that we associate in church today. Traditions like Sunday worship. The Sabbath, which is the seventh day of the week, was the day of rest for Israel. It is the fourth commandment to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. But the Roman Catholic Church changed the Sabbath day to the first day of the week. Constantine made the first day of the week the Lord's Day. He issued a civil decree that all judges and city people and the craftsmen shall rest upon the venerable day of the sun. Why it's called Sunday. And the day of rest was changed from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week. This was a tradition passed down over time. So that today, you ask a Christian that has been going to church all of their life why they go to church on Sunday, and they probably have no clue. Because it's tradition. They just do it. Another tradition that is in the church today is tithing. Tithing was an Old Testament obligation that was placed on... I know I let this go for too long for a second, but 
let's go back and check this out real quick. Constantine wanted Sunday worshipers is what we're looking for. It was like 30 seconds ago, probably. Hey, of the sun. Why it's called Sunday. So Constantine the Great, March 7th, 321 AD, all judges and city people and the craftsmen shall rest on the venerable day of the sun. The craftsmen are the builders. So Constantine is in right here talking about the Freemasons. The judges are always Freemasons. The city officials are always Freemasons. The craftsmen are always Freemasons. And these people are venerated on Sundays. Remember, Yeshua said that the builders could easily be Constantine using the craftsmen, because remember that Freemasons are the fellow craft. And I'm pretty sure that the venerable part, if you stopped the video and jumped over into Google and put in Freemasonry and venerable or venerable day of the sun or something like that, it would instantly pop up a Freemason teaching. So inside Constantine's stuff, it even kind of sounds like he may have more esoteric knowledge than what this quote actually would make people think. And the Holy. But the Roman Catholic Church of the week was the day of rest for Israel. It is the fourth commandment to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. But the Roman Catholic Church changed the Sabbath day to the first day of the week. Constantine made the first day of the week the Lord's Day. He issued a civil decree that all judges and city people and the craftsmen shall rest upon the venerable day of the sun. Why it's called Sunday. And the day of rest was changed from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week. This was a tradition passed down over time. So that today... You ask a Christian that has been going to church all of their life why they go to church on Sunday, and they probably have no clue. Because it's tradition. They just do it. Another tradition that is in the church today is tithing. Tithing was an Old Testament obligation that was placed on the Israelites under the law of Moses. They were required to support the Levites who were the priests and had no inheritance of land. Behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work which they perform, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. That's Numbers chapter 18, verse 21. That's where you get the commandment of tithing from. And then there are others that understand this commandment of tithing that was given to the Levites. So they go back to Genesis 14, when Abraham tithes his possessions to Melchizedek, his spoils of war. But from this example, you do not see a commandment or obligation to tithe. It was an example, yes. But today, many feel that tithing is an obligation. So where did it come from? I mean, there have been churches and pastors that have kicked members out of the church for not tithing. Some send letters to members telling that they are not properly keeping up with their tithe. Simmons says he knows his aunt isn't the first person to receive a letter of removal for not tithing and hopes this story will shed some light on the policy. But the early church did not tithe. They gave willingly through offerings. There's nothing wrong with giving, but the doctrine of tithing today is not biblical. Today, tithing is generally defined as the tenth part of all fruits and profits justly acquired owed to God in recognition of his supreme dominion over man and to be paid to the ministers of the church. But the adoption of the doctrine of tithing from the law did not come from the early church, but Roman Catholic tradition. As the church expanded within the Roman Empire and institutions grew, it became necessary to make laws which would ensure the proper and permanent support of the clergy. The payment of tithes was adopted from the law of Moses. Over time, 
we see that the payment of tithes was made as an obligation for the church. It was a requirement. This was to support the organization of the church, but it was not a commandment of Elohim, but a tradition that men placed. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7 says, So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for Elohim loves a cheerful giver. This is how the churches are to give, by what the Holy Spirit places on their heart, and not out of necessity. But man created this tradition to ensure that the church grew, removing the power of the Holy Spirit and placing their own tradition as the source. And over time, this tradition has been accepted. And now some of the worst churches ever created are growing exponentially because the church feels required to give rather than give by what is placed on their hearts. It's all about tradition. Then we see through the church's celebration of pagan holidays how the church aligns with the Catholic belief of mixing scripture and tradition. A majority of the churches allow the world into their faith by giving tradition the same importance as scripture. So the traditions of celebrating Christmas and Easter have been passed down over time and accepted. But none of it is scriptural. They're giving tradition the same level of importance as scripture. So what am I getting at in this video? Am I church bashing? Am I going against the church? If that is what you are feeling, let me sum things up for you. I am not against the church. What I want is for people to not make it about going to church. And I want them to start being the church. Now, if you have a place of worship that you feel totally aligns with the word of Elohim, then you should continue to grow and fellowship with them and know you are blessed. I do not believe that all churches are bad. And I'm sure there are many churches and pastors that teach the pure word of Elohim and leave the ways of the world out. So if you're a part of one, Feel blessed and continue in your fellowship with them. I'm not speaking against you. Use your own discernment. But if you're waking up from the deception of this world and truly you're seeking the Father through his word and you're seeing many hypocrisies within your church and your spirit is nudging you that it's wrong, it is not wrong for you to leave that church. And you do not need to be part of a church organization to be a member of his church. Now, you should not forsake the assembly with others. So if you do come across other like-minded believers, you should fellowship with them. But you do not stay under false teaching, false traditions, and false doctrine, all for the sake of assembling with others, especially if you have children. Tradition has told us that being a Christian means going to church. But the truth is, being a believer in Yahshua, following the way, is not going to church, but being the church. Do you remember the definition through scripture we spoke about earlier in the video? What the church is? The church is the assembly of people that believe that Yahshua is the Messiah, the son of the living Elohim. Those that have repented and have been baptized are added to his assembly. And anywhere two or three are gathered together in his name, he is in the midst of them. The church is his body and he gave himself for her. The Messiah is the head of the church, and the church is subject to him. You are to be guided and led by the Holy Spirit. Walk in the power of your redemption. You are to be set apart. Live by the word and always let the word have the last say. There is nothing wrong with meeting in your home, having Bible studies, and having fellowship in your home. A lot of times, this is where pure accountability and fellowship happens. Raising your kids under sound doctrine. Reading the word with them together without the religious dogma and traditions that are not biblical. I get many messages asking me what the true denomination of Christianity is. Or can I help them find a church home because they cannot find churches that are not compromising. The reason I made this video is because I truly feel that time is almost up. And the Father is waking up the church and calling many to repentance and to worship him in spirit and in truth as he seeks. I want everyone to know that you must be the solution. There shouldn't even be any denominations. There is only one church. And the true denomination are those that place the word as the final authority and live by it only, rejecting the world and its traditions. If you cannot find a church home, Make your home a church. Have Bible study with others in your home and invite others that want to grow. In my awakening years ago, 
I sincerely thought I had to go to church. I even had friends and family that looked at me as a heathen because I stopped going to church and started having church in my home with my family. But this was one of the best decisions I've ever made because this is how I drew closer to Elohim. Do you know what Yahshua said in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14? He said, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. You see, the gate to life is narrow and difficult, and there are few who find it, so do not be alarmed if your path is becoming narrower. It's not an easy path. The church is who you are, not where you go. Be the answers to all the problems you are seeing. Be an example to others that also want to be narrower in their faith, but just don't know how. Sometimes dropping tradition can be very difficult to do because they are things that you have done all your life, and everyone else around you is still doing them as if there's no harm. What I am calling for everyone to do is to be narrower. Don't be broad. Just because everyone is doing something does not make it right. It actually means the opposite. You must know what the church... So, we're going to switch up real quick. The, I'm going to switch over to Olive Branch, and we're going to pull up the video that's called Have You Taken the Name of the Lord in Vain, I think is the title. One second. So, this is, if you are calling yourself a Christian, and you're taking on the name of Messiah, this is taking on the name in vain. Have you taken the name of Yeshua as a Catholic, as a Protestant, as a something outside of the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Hebraic faith? Have you taken it from the Calvary chapels? Have you taken it from the Baptists? Have you decided that your faith is through the Pentecostals or it's through the viewpoint of Bill Johnson or through uh, Calvin or through Chris Valentin or through any of the Martin Luthers? Is your faith through a Pope? Is your faith through or is your faith according to the scriptures? What's inside the word? Have you taken on the attributes of Messiah according to scripture? Or have you just taken on the Sunday worship traditions of your fathers? I used to do the Sunday worship stuff of my fathers until I came to the point of understanding that the front of the book, the back of the book, they both work together. And when you get them together and you get rid of the false teachings that people twist Paul, then stuff starts making a whole lot more sense. So before, even when I was in the... Asking Jesus to be my savior when I was seven years old, I still would have been considered inside the believing body, but I would not have been bridal material because my understanding would still be with the dispensational theology of the time frame from Adam through Revelation had been broken up into seven different distinct time periods. And in each of those seven different time periods, God treated mankind differently. That's dispensational theology that goes along with all of the Calvary chapels. Now, inside the scriptures, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the Torah is his delight. Like, that every single thing, the Torah is his ketubah. It's his wedding um, agreement with the bride. If you're going to be part of the bride of Yeshua, you have to have the Torah is the 
milk. It's the foundation. It's what you would have had in the very beginning when you were a child. You would have learned the Torah, and the Torah would have been your pedagogue. It would have been your instructor. It would have been the person that walked to the um, slave that walked to school with you and made sure that you were safe while you were outside the protection of your parents, they would have a slave that would have gone to school with you and the slave would have instructed you as an older slave teaching the son of the slave owner. The pedagogue would have kept you safe and trained you up correctly according to the teachings you were getting at your school. And so that's what the Holy Spirit is to do. It's the pedagogue, the, the whole Torah is to be written on our hearts. And that's what the job of the Holy Spirit is to do is to write the Torah on our hearts. So once all of this happens, have you taken the name of Yeshua in vain? Because even though you said I'm a Christian and I've put on that bumper sticker that says I'm a Christian, are you still practicing the pagan Easter? Are you still practicing the pagan Christmas? Are you still, like, are you keeping the holy feast dates that Yeshua has inside of his faith? Are you keeping the Sabbath holy? Are you attempting to keep the, the Torah as best you can? Because that would show that you are inside of a covenant that he has made with the the seed of Abraham. If you have put on Messiah, there is no longer slave or free, Greek or like the whole list. You are one in Messiah if you have put on Messiah, and therefore you are heirs of, I always get this thing wrong, you are seeds of Abraham and heirs according to the word. So, if you've put on Messiah, then you get to be the heir, but have you put on Messiah? Have you taken his name in vain? Taking his name in vain. Right, we all know what that means. <laughs> Those of you who know me well enough will probably know that when I do a series on something that we think we know well, well, we probably don't know it as well as what we thought we did. And taking his name in vain is absolutely one of these things. Um, I don't know if you remember, but last week we kind of briefly touched on uh, the Ten Commandments. And, uh, we, you know, this commandment, do not take the Yah's name in vain, came up. And I said, maybe I'll do a study on this. Well, here we are. Um, and I actually think it's a study that's very uh, befitting the lead up to Unleavened Bread. We're actually only... Okay. I'm going to rewind this in one second, but several of the people that watch the Exposing Bethel channel have asked for videos explaining the lifting of hands to God. This video is what you guys would, any information that I would be able to give you, Michael covers it inside this video. So I'll rewind this so that he can get back into his thought. But anybody who's asked for those videos, and it's been several people, this is what you would want to listen to you. Hey, what? Kind of briefly touched on uh, the Ten Commandments, and uh, we, you know, this commandment, do not take the Yah's name in vain, came up, and I said, maybe I'll do a study on this. Well, here we are. Um, 
And I actually think it's a study that's very uh, befitting the lead up to Unleavened Bread. We're actually only, what, a couple of months away now? Um, and from just how I've been, just from looking at my study notes, I have a feeling this is going to be a three-part series, uh, which will lead us actually really nicely into thinking about Unleavened Bread and Pesach. Um, Part one, lift up your voice. So we're going to, there's going to be a focus on our words, our hearts, obviously, because our, our mouths speak from the overflow of our hearts, which then implies witness. Um, so as we go through today's teaching, I just want you to have constantly in the back of your mind taking his name in vain um, or bringing disrepute or dishonor. Think of your witness um, and it's easy to point at other people. Oh, they're taking Yah's name in vain. I mean, look at the Hebrew roots, or the, the Hebrew uprooters, right? And then or we like to point at the Christians and go, and, it's like, and we fail to look at ourselves. Are we taking his name in vain? And believe me, man, this one can get really subtle. It can be very, very subtle um, just because other people can't see you taking his name in vain doesn't mean that you're not doing it. So, let's go to the Torah, specifically Exodus or Shemot, as it's called in Hebrew. And let's look, we're, we're not going to do a full breakdown of the Ten Commandments, but I'm just using this as a springboard. And Elohim spoke all these words, saying... I am Yah your Elohim who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of slavery. You have no other mighty ones against my face. You do not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of that which is in the heavens above or which is in the earth beneath or which is in the waters underneath. You do not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, Yah, your Elohim, am a jealous out, visiting the crookedness of the fathers on the children and the, to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. I've mentioned this in the past, but generally, as it's taught, you'll find that commandment number one is verse number three, you will have no other gods before me. And that then commandment number two is do not make yourself a carved image. There's actually another way of grouping this, because carved images, you could argue is verse four is part of verse three. Because another god and a carved image, you could lump it together, which means that the first word would be, I am Yah, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. This is actually how Judah breaks up the Ten Commandments, generally. Commandment number one is, I am Yah, your Elohim. Remember that. And then it goes into spiritual adultery, not having other gods. I find that an interesting point. But either way, however you want to break it up, I'm not dogmatic on it, it's very interesting that the very first thing that Yah addresses in his covenant is identity, this is who I am, this is what I've done for you, by the way, you will have no other gods before me, you will, you know, and so think of spiritual adultery here. And then he goes on, but showing loving commitment to thousands, to those who love me and guard my commands. So the showing loving commitment is actually conditional upon loving him and guarding his commands. You do not bring the name of Yah, your Elohim, to naught. So the King James or other English translations, this is where you see, do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The ISR says you do not bring the name of Yah, your Elohim, to naught. For Yah does not leave the one unpunished who brings his name to naught. So it would behoove us to really know what it means to take his name in vain because there's a condition attached to this of punishment. That there's actually chastisement that comes our way for doing this. The word there, bring, in the Hebrew is nasar. Nasar means to lift, to bear, or what's really interesting here, to affirmingly lift up one's hand in a solemn declaration, as in an oath. Um, I think we're going to briefly touch upon this today, actually. But 
every dictionary that I looked at, especially the, the more simple ones like Strong's or Mickelson's or Thayer's, uh, you, you get a very small definition. And it's not unless you do a proper word study on this word and you, that you realize it's actually got a really uh, broad semantic range and it's actually very rich. I'm going to make a statement. The whole plan of redemption can be found by studying this one word. From covenant to uh, judgment to restoration. Okay? So, word families. You guys know that I love geeking out on Hebrew and word families. So the way that Hebrew is, you have your root word, nasa, in this case, this top one. And this is the word that's take or lift or to bear. And from that word, you get a whole list of other words that are part of the same verbal family. So as you can see here, to lift, carry, take, this is the basic understanding of this word. If you look the one below, nisua, what is carried about? So you could say a burden, something that you carry on your shoulders. Nasi, prince, captain, leader, someone who's high and lifted up is, is the, the, the idea behind that. Um, here, masa, load, burden, lifting. And here we're going to, masa as well, burden, oracle. We'll get to that today. Um, here, as you can see, the word see, loftiness, or se'et, exaltation, dignity, swelling. So this I essentially think to lift up, because it's lifted up, it can also have this idea of carrying or bearing. So things bearing one another's burdens would come into this. Um, but we're going to see some of these words, especially masa uh, and nasi, as we get further through the series. Does that make sense so far? So let's look at very basic stuff and then we'll build upon the basics. We'll build on the foundation. You'll see this idiom an awful lot in the scripture to lift up one's voice. And it can be used, it's usually used in conjunction with another verb. Lift up your voice and cry out or lift up your voice and sing. Um, in Genesis 27:38, and Esau said to his father, have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me too, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. So here you see the idiom and then the explanation of how he's lifting his voice. Because you can lift your voice in a positive sense, you can lift your voice in a negative sense. And here it's weeping. So the Hebrew here is va yisa. So this is yisa is the conju uh, future conjugation of the word nasa. So here's your verb, esav, which is the Hebrew for Esau, and then kolor. So literally, and he lifted up his voice. Esau lifted up his voice. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 4, and David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. So again, it's the same. Whenever you see they lifted up their voice, you will generally always see another verb after it to tell you which way it's going. Is it weeping? Is it exaltation? So again here, Vayisa David Vehaam, so and lifted up David and the people, uh, Asher Iti, Ito, sorry, those that were with him, et kolam, so their voices. So again you have this word, Nasa. Here it's again it's conjugated into future tense, so it's Yisa. It's actually the same word used in the Aaronic blessing. Yah will lift his face towards you. Yisa Adonai. So it's this word again, to lift up or to lift towards. Numbers 14.1. This is just before they're about, this is just before they're about to be judged to die in the wilderness, right after the uh, slanderous report of the spies. 
Then all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And so again here, Vatisa. So Tisa is just a different conjugation again, but this is your verb here, Nasa, uh, to lift up. Vatisa, Kol Haida, the whole congregation or the whole witness. And here, Vayitnu et Kolam. So this word here, Yitnu, actually comes from the word Natan, which means to give. This is where the name Nathan comes from. Uh, Yehonatan, Jonathan means Yah has given. So I've chosen to include this because notice how they've translated this. The congregation lifted up their voice and cried. And actually in the Hebrew is saying that the congregation, the whole congregation, lifted up their voice and gave their voice. They lifted up and gave their voice to, the, to weeping. Bear the word give in this context, in the context of lifting up your voice, because we're going to see a very interesting connection here. So the Hebrew is speaking idiomatically here. What are you, what are you giving your voice unto? Judges 2.4 it came to be when the messenger of Yah spoke these words. Basically, the messenger of Elohim is um, pronouncing judgment on them. He's saying, because you've not obeyed, I am no longer going to protect you and things like that. Because of that, uh, when the messenger of Yah spoke these words to all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and wept again. So again here, Vayisu. So Yisu is again a different conjugation, but it's the same root word, Nasa. And they lifted up their voice. So this is just four examples. This idiom of lifting up the voice happens hundred like over a hundred times in the scripture. Um, I've just given you four to make the point. What's really interesting is that this idiom even makes its way to the so-called New Testament. It makes its way to the Gospels. Now, what language are the Gospels traditionally written in that we have? Greek. Well, what I found very interesting here, Luke 17, 12 and 13, as he was entering a certain village, he was met by 10 leprous men who stood at a distance and they lifted up their voices saying, Yeshua, Master, have compassion on us. I actually believe this is evidence that the people spoke Hebrew in the first century because even the Greek has preserved a Hebrew idiom to lift up your voice, which I find interesting. Acts chapter 2. So this is, you know, Pentecost, Shavuot. But Kephar, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said to the men of Yehudah and all those dwelling in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen closely to my words. And essentially he goes on to tell them to repent, to, to be baptized or immersed in the name of Yeshua. But again... You have a Hebrew using a Hebrew idiom that's been preserved in the Greek. So I actually think this is evidence that the people did speak Hebrew. I mention this because in scholar, in academia, there's a lot of bickering over this issue. For these men are not drunk as you imagine, since it is only the third hour of the day. You see it again in Acts chapter 4. So this is... If I'm not mistaken, Peter and John. And having been released, so they've just been questioned by the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin want to obviously shut them up, but they say, well, we can't deny what we've seen and we're going to keep doing what we're doing. Having been released, they went to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders said to them. And having heard that, they lifted up their voice to Elohim, now look at this, with one mind, and said, Yah, you are Elohim who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. So we see here you can lift up your voice and do two very different things. 
You can be like the congregation in the wilderness who lifted up their voice and wept and actually brought accusations not only against Moses and Aaron, but ultimately against Elohim. They slandered his character. They gave their voice unto evil. Or you can lift up your voice and be of one mind with your brethren. Which one do you think will be pleasing in the eyes of Elohim? Which one will be a, a, a sweet-smelling sacrifice of praise, and which one will offer up a foul stench? Let's go back to the Tanakh, specifically the book of Proverbs. You know I said keep in the back of your mind this idea of giving your voice, being a, connected to lifting up your voice? Proverbs 120, wisdom calls aloud outside. She raises her voice in the broad places. And this is the Hebrew here. So Bachovot is in the broad places. Titen kola. Titen is a conjugation of the verb netan. Again, it's a future uh, conjugation. So literally it's saying in the broad places, she gives her voice. So here it's being translated as raise, but she, wisdom is giving her voice. She's calling aloud. Again in Proverbs 8.1, does not wisdom call and understanding lift up her voice? The word here is not um, nasa, to lift up. Again here, Utevuna and understanding, Titem Kola gives her voice. She gives her voice. So this implies you could you could argue this this idea of it's actually a free gift. Are you willing to grab onto it? Proverbs 2, for if you cry for discernment, lift up your voice for understanding. If you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, then you would understand the fear of Yah and find the knowledge of Elohim. Again, here, the, the idea of lifting up your voice here is the same language. La tevuna, so unto understanding, titen kolecha, so you, you shall give your voice unto understanding. So wisdom and understanding both cry out, they give their voice to anyone that would listen to them, which implies you need ears to hear. Here it says you need to cry for it. You need to lift your voice or give your voice so that you can get understanding. So this then brings up the idea of our prayer life. So what we lift up with our mouths. So remember that our mouths speak from the overflow of our hearts. So whatever's going on in our hearts, that is what we will lift up unto Elohim. That is what will come out of our mouth, and this is what others will hear and see. So now what you say and do becomes a witness to those watching of you, how you lift the name of Elohim, how you bear it, how you carry it. You know, in the ironic blessing, right before it, or is it just after, it says, this is how you shall bless the house of Israel and put my name upon them. You bear the name of Elohim. You carry it. You nasar it. It's on you, whether you, you know, it's spiritually speaking. So what you say and do, and what, come, what you give your voice unto, is a witness of how you bear it. If you bear it with dignity, honor, respect, integrity, or dishonor, shame. Let's link this to our prayer life, lifting up the voice, because like I said, you can lift up your voice in, in prayer, you can lift up your voice in praise, you can lift up your voice and weep. Here, uh, Proverbs we've just read, it says, give your voice, lift your voice so that you can have wisdom and understanding. Yeshua says this, when praying, do not keep on babbling like the nations, for they think that they shall be heard for their many words. So what are you giving or lifting your voice unto? I'm pretty sure that Elohim heard you the first time. 
Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. You, you actually technically don't need to ask, because He already knows you need it. Do you have faith that He will provide? Drop down to the bottom of the chapter, verse 25. Because of this I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you shall eat or drink, or about the body, or what you shall put on. Is not life more than the food, and the body more than the clothing? Look at the birds of heaven, for they neither sow nor reap, nor gather into storehouses, yet your heavenly Father does feed them. Are you not worth more than they? Guilty as charged, but when I was young and infant-like in my faith, all my worries would come through my prayers. Oh, Father, I'm worried about this. And, da, 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 da. and Now I don't even need to. Because he already knows. As you grow in your faith, you'll find that you actually worry less. Especially about earthly, worldly things. There's very few things I will now request. Like, Father, this is what I want. Because it took me, you, when I do that, it's very rare because I'm finally starting to understand what it means to make a request before Elohim. And it, would it be part of his will? Which of you, by worrying, is able to add one cubit to his life span? If anything, worry and anxiety will shorten your lifespan. Science is actually showing you this. So why do you worry about clothing? Note well the lilies of the field, how they grow, neither tall nor spin. And I say to you that even Shlomo, Solomon, in all his esteem, was not dressed like one of these. But if Elohim so clothes the grass of the field, which exists today, and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, how much more you owe you of little belief, of little faith? So you can tell a lot about someone's faith or lack thereof by the very request, by what they lift up their voice unto. Do not worry then, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? Notice that Yeshua is actually focusing here, not on spiritual matters. He's actually focusing, in regards to this, on earthly matters. It's all earthly stuff. Eating, drinking, what shall we wear? P protection, shelter. Yeshua is saying, why are you even asking? Your Father in Heaven knows that you need these things. So why... Like, if, when you, I'm going to say it this way. If you're too busy worrying about this stuff, you're not actually worrying about the things that matter and asking him for things that actually truly matter. What I do see in Scripture that we're to ask for is forgiveness, repentance, and wisdom and discernment. For all these the nations seek for. And your, earth, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these. So are we going to be like the nations? And so, unfortunately, I see some of the prayer life, this is, a, this is a broad brushstroke, by the way, but I've seen people's prayer life and things that are generally being asked for by the wider body. If you were to take away the name of Elohim and the Amen at the end, you could easily make an Instagram video out of it. And that doesn't jive, it should, like, at least not with me. Why do we sound like the nations? Oh, I need to make sure that this is done. This, like, I'm not talking about being unwise in the flesh here. But Elohim provides. How? Seek first the reign of Elohim and his righteousness, and all these shall be added unto you. You know... I'm going, I think I've said something along these lines before, but I'll say it again. Um, I've never been as physically blessed as I am now, ever in my life. Now, let me quantify that. I'm not rolling around in money. I'm not. But what I mean by that is that I do not have an overdraft and I have a car and a house. Granted, the car is secondhand, but I need not. I have no need and I have no overdraft. And the house is nice. It's average. It's nice. The point that I'm trying to say is I never asked for any of that, ever. I was too busy 
seeking first the reign of Elohim and his righteousness. I was too busy serving, actually. And I remember just kind of almost realizing one day, wow, how did all this come about? Because, like I say, I've never been this blessed. The world would look at it and go, oh, it's average. But like, I see the value in it. And I, not once did I have to ask. The, the, I was talking about this with my wife and someone else, but the last time I actually asked something from, from Elohim was about three, no, four or five years ago, actually. We were moving from the north of England down to the south. For those of you who don't know, I was working full-time for Rome and doing full-time ministry for about a year and a half, nearly two years. I nearly burnt out, basically. I was like, the stress levels were actually starting to come through as physical symptoms. And we were visiting this little cottage, which was out in the country, out of nowhere, out in the middle of nowhere. And that was one of the few times I said, Father, I would like this cottage because I was this close from breakdown. Those of you who were around at the time may know. But the only reason I asked for it, actually, was because I knew if I broke down, so to speak, it would affect my service. It would affect my service to the body. And I was granted that little cottage in the country, which meant I had a year of peace and quiet to decompress from Rome and everything. That's the one time I asked for something. And the driver behind it wasn't for me, actually. It was for the body. If I have a nervy, if you want to call it that, it will affect my service. And so the father was gracious. But since then, you know, again, I've had to be wise in the flesh. I've had to live in my means, something that people need to learn, actually, by and large. I've done my wise part in the flesh. But the whole time I was seeking the reign of Elohim. And now I can look back and go, wow. So why ask for it? Do not then worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow shall have its own worries. Each day has enough of itself. During the last three to five years, the, again, I ask for very few things. What I do ask for is wisdom, understanding. And that I don't ask too often. Why? Because Yah heard me the first time, first of all. Secondly, he's given me brothers. He's given me a counsel that I can go to. The things I ask for now matter. They're not trivial. And this is what Yeshua is saying. And Go read the Psalms. What is David complaining about? Is he complaining that he's a bit skint? Is he complaining that someone said some mean things to him? No, he's complaining that people are out to kill him. That his closest brothers are, uh, are betraying him. It should kind of put our life into perspective a bit. Proverbs 27. He who greets his friend loudly early in the morning shall have it, to him, have it reckoned to him as a curse. You know when people come at you first saying, Hello! And you're just like, go away. The point I want to bring is, are we doing this to our creator? We, what are we lifting our voice onto? Are we literally chewing his ear off with all these menial, pointless things that are all temporary anyway? Drops that never cease on a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. The modern equivalent is that, you know, the dripping tap expression, nag, nag, nag. Is that what we do to our king? Because I can guarantee you, most of you will have heard this being taught in Christianity, that you just keep asking and asking and asking until you get it. Parents, how does that work when your kids do that to you? Does it work? Or does it actually drive you further away from giving them what they want? You know, when Yeshua says, when you make a request, paraphrase here, is act as if you've already had it given, which means you're not nag, 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 because you know it's coming at the right time as he decides if he chooses to give it to you. 
And I believe, by the way, I'm guilty of this. Guilty as charged. So this is not to condemn. Whoever represses her represses the wind, and his right hand encounters oil. So the Hebrew here, Sofnea, uh, the one repressing her, Safan uh, Ruach. So Safan actually means to hide, to conceal. Um, to shroud so this is why they say to repress like whoever represses or tries to conceal a contentious woman represses the wind basically it's pointless you are, you're, you're not going to do it now the word for wind is ruach, which is spirit I actually believe here that it's saying that if you have a contentious woman now we are the woman, remember, in the spiritual shadow picture. Sorry, in the spiritual picture. We're supposed to be the bride. So if we're the contentious woman, are we actually repressing or blocking the voice of the Ruach in our lives by being contentious with each other? And his right hand encounters oil. The idea is that you go to grip something with your strong hand, the right hand, and it slips out your hand like you, you, it's coated in oil. Basically saying, if you have this contentious behavior, you cannot control it. And the more you try to put a grip on it, it's going to blow up in your face. I just find it interesting that this is all in the context of what we use our voice for. How are we praying to our king? Are we this contentious woman? Let's look at, so we've looked at lifting the voice. Let's look at the idea of lifting the hand. Because lifting the hand is very closely related to lifting the voice. And Achimaz called out and said to the sovereign, Peace. Then he bowed down with his face to the earth before the sovereign and said, Blessed be Yah your Elohim, who has surrendered the men who raised their hand against my master, the sovereign. So here, let's focus on the bottom one actually. Asher Nasu, so that lifted up, okay? Et Yadam, their hands, Badonai Hamalech, against the Lord the King. But this word here, Nasu, is the same word that is used in do not take or lift the Elohim's name in vain. So to lift, to raise. Now here is being ra raising the hand is an idiom again to action. What are you off to do? Generally to raise the hand is actually a sign of defiance, but it's also you could raise the hand in an oath, as we're going to see. So again, how are you raising your things, your hand? Deuteronomy 32, this is Yah speaking of the future of the house of Israel, that he will need to judge them, scatter them. Why? Because of their spiritual adultery. I said I should blow them away. I should make the remembrance of them to cease from among men. If I did not fear the enemy's taunt, lest their adversaries misunderstand, lest they say, our hand is high and Yah has not done all of this. So this is uh, the house of Israel essentially taking credit for Elohim, what Elohim has done. Now, our hand is high, Yadenu Rama. Rama means to be, it comes from the word rum, and again it means to be high and lofty. So it's, it's a, what's the word? It's a synonym to uh, the word nasa, to lift up. Rum means to be high and lofty, exalted. So this idea of our hand is high. And so you'll see that as this expression of lifting, because their hand is high, therefore their speech, they're lifting their voices against Elohim. The mouth is overflowing from the heart. Numbers 15. For him who does whatever by mistake, there is one Torah, both for him who is native among the children of Israel and for the stranger who sojourns in their midst. But the being who does whatever defiantly, whether he is native or a stranger, he reviles Yah, that being shall be cut off from among his people. 
Defiantly is a bit of a bad translation. Well, it's a, it's a semantic translation as opposed to a literal translation. Vehanefesh and the soul or the being, a shertase who does or who works, beyad hama with a high hand. Defiantly, the Hebrew behind it is actually to do it with a high hand. So you're lifting your hand up against Elohim in this case here. Now to do it with a high hand means you know exactly what you're doing. It's rebellion. It's stubbornness. Because he has despised the word of Yah and has broken his command, that being shall certainly be cut off. His crookedness is upon him. Now, going back here, he reviles Yah. When you read, I don't know, I know for me, when I see the word revile, I think speech. But actually, he's saying here that your actions, as, uh, in, you're reviling Yah through your action not through your speech. The speech is just an outcome of what's going on in the heart already. And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. So this is sandwiched right in between the man gathering sticks and the generation condemned to die in the wilderness. By the way, this is why he was treated so harshly, because he was doing it with a high hand. He, would, he knew exactly what he was doing. And as I've said in the past, he was like, well, what's the point? I'm going to do my own thing anyway. So here we see to have a high hand in the negative context. Deuteronomy 29. Not with you alone I am making this covenant and this oath, but with him who stands here with us today before Yah Elohim, as well as with him who is not here with us today. For you know how we dwell in the land of Mitzrayim, and how we passed through the nations which you passed through. And you saw their abominations and their idols, wood and stone, silver and gold, which were with them. Lest there should be among you a man or a woman or clan or tribe, whose heart turns away today from Yah Elohim, to go and serve the mighty ones of these nations. Lest there should be among you a root bearing bitterness or wormwood. And it shall be, so this is what characterizes this person. So when he hears the words of this curse, that he should bless himself in his heart, saying, I have peace, though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart, in order to add drunkenness to thirst. The, the English kind of glosses over the nuance of the Hebrew right here. It says, Shalom Yihyeli, so peace shall be unto me. Uh, so because in the stubbornness is plural, libi of my heart, elech, I will walk. It's actually in future tense. So it's saying, peace shall be unto me. Why? Because in the stubbornness of my heart, I am going to walk. It's actually showing the defiance here in the Hebrew more clearly. This is essentially someone who's not listening to sound counsel. You've tried to counsel him. You've tried to say, please don't do this. And he's saying, I'm going to do what I'm going to do anyway. And I'm going to be blessed while doing it. That's the mentality that's being given here. And so as a result, they lift their hand up. They're lifting their hand against you and their speech is lifted against you just as an outcome of what's going on in the heart. It's all coming from the heart. So this is why I say to lift your voice and to lift your hand are very much connected because there will be an outflow of what's going on in here. Yah would not forgive him, but rather the displeasure of Yah and his jealousy shall burn against that man. And every curse that is written in this book shall settle on him and Yah shall blot out his name from under the heavens. It sounds like a more extreme version that if you take his name in vain, he will not leave you unpunished. Yah shall separate him for evil out of all the tribes of Israel according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in this book of the Torah. Why? Because through his actions and by spurning sound counsel, you're actually taking the name of Yah in vain. 
because it's not the counsel of it's not the people giving you the counsel that you're spurning it's the one it's the spirit in them if these people are spirit-filled uh, covenanted people that Yah works through and you spurn their counsel is it them you're spurning This is a lesson I learned a while back, and I believe it's part of the reason I've been as blessed as I have in my life, because I've listened to my counsellors, because I know Yah speaks through them. Proverbs 5, my son, listen to my wisdom, incline your ear to my understanding, so as to watch over discretion and your lips guard knowledge. Um, I have a feeling Curtis is going to cover this today, actually. But to watch over discretion again, the, the, the English, uh, just, it doesn't encapsulate it. Lismore, mesimot, so lismore, lismore, sorry. It's the word shamar, to guard. So it's to guard over mesimot. So what does mesimot mean? It comes from the word mesima, which means purpose, discretion, a device or a plot. Sometimes evil, sometimes good. The other dictionary says a plan, usually evil, sometimes good, uh, sagacity. So this idea of being able to think critical thoughts, the idea to be able to weigh something up in your mind and as a result you can create a plan and have a flow of action. This is what it's saying. Listen to wisdom, incline to your ear to understanding so that you can guard the ability to actually think critically is what the proverb is saying. Because if you don't have wisdom, if you don't have understanding, you're not, you're not guarding over your mind and your heart. And your lips guard knowledge. Let's keep going. Why does he say that? For the lips of a strange woman drip honey in her mouth is smoother than oil. So this is why you need wisdom and counsel so that you can guard what's going on in your mind because there's a strange woman going about trying to seduce you. In the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lay hold of Sheol. She does not consider the path of life. Her ways are unstable. You do not know it. And I've mentioned this in the past, that when you entertain spiritual adultery, you will have chaos in your life. There's no better way to put it if you have chaos in your life and nothing is going right you have spiritual adultery somehow in your life even job had something going on did he not he needed some pride knocking out of him the thing is is you try and warn someone and you say don't do this don't do this and they don't know it they don't know it. They've not guarded the battleground of their mind. So now listen to me, you children, and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her and do not come near the door of her house. Lest you give your splendors to others in your years to one who is cruel. So you see that by entertaining this, you get punished. You will eat, you will reap the fruit that you have sown. Which is very much in the context of lifting your voice and lifting up, especially here, lifting up your hand. What actions are you going to do? And as a result, are you going to bring honor to his name or not? Let strangers be filled with your strength and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. Then you shall howl in your latter end when your flesh and your body are consumed and shall say, how I have hated discipline and my heart has despised reproof. Go back to the bitter root. I have peace. Peace will come my way and I'm going to do what, my, what I want to do. And no one can tell me otherwise. This is the same kind of character profile here. And I have not heeded the voice of my teachers and have not inclined my ears to those who instructed me. The word instruction has the idea of chastisement in the Hebrew as well. In a little while I was in all evil, in the midst of an assembly and a congregation. So this, you, you don't get to point this now at those outside. It's speaking of those in the body right here, right now. 
the point it's saying is that if you don't watch this stuff, if you don't guard your mind, if you don't heed the voice of those that have gone before you, just like that, you could be in the best assembly ever. And boom, you've got all this going on. Therefore, drink water from your own cistern and running water from your own well. Why should your springs be scattered abroad? Rivers of water in the streets. By the way, rivers of water in the street. I believe what the proverb is trying to say is that there's, you're drinking water from a dirty street like a dog, is what it's saying. Now, right now, let me phrase it this way. There's a brother and I, we like to use this expression that someone is drinking from many different fountains or many different wells. And you can tell because they're all confused and they're like, boop, 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 boop. It's like they've got spiritual ADHD. They can't focus. And that, again, their, their, their lives are usually characterized by disorder, instability, and even chaos. Because they're listening to all of this stuff. They're drinking from many fountains. You may as well be drinking rivers of water in the street. Remember I said lifting up your hand to have a high hand? Exodus 14.8, Yah strengthened the heart of Pharaoh, sovereign of Mitzrayim, and he pursued the children of Israel. But the children of Israel went out defiantly. The, here, let me bring up the mouse. Uvne Yisrael and the sons of Israel, uh, Yotzim, so they went out. Beyad uh, Rama, they went out with a high hand. Here it's used in the positive sense. Is it a good thing that Israel went out from Egypt boldly with a high hand? Yes. Who was strengthening their hand? It was Elohim. Now, let me flip this round. Yah is strengthening their hand to do something that defies logic, is he not? They're like, there's miracles going off everywhere, and he's saying, I will be with you. Imagine if they said, now we're staying here. Whose name are they, bring, are they taking in vain? So it can actually happen both ways. You can lift your hand up from a sense of pride and be like, I am my own Elohim. You, you, you act as your own God, and thus you take his name in vain. Or he tries to strengthen your hand and you go, not doing it. Self-condemnation is a kicker for that, by the way. Or false humility. This is repeated in Numbers 33, verse 3. Again, on the morrow of the Pesach here, the children of Yisrael went out with boldness before the eyes of all the Mitzrites. It's the same language here, Yatsu, so they went forth, Vnei uh, Yisrael, the sons of Israel, Beyad Rama, with a high hand, an exalted hand. So here, you, so again, like, it's not that having a high hand is bad or that it's good. It's in how are you using it. In the same way with your speech, how are you using it? As, as Yaakov or James would say, you know, the tongue, we will, out of it comes curses and blessings. At, at the same time, we're blessing our brothers with it. It shouldn't be so. So who's strengthening your hand? Is it self or is it Elohim? And if Elohim is wanting to strengthen your hand, are you going to take his name in vain by not acting in faith? Remember that the Exodus account wasn't just about dealing with Egypt's pantheon of gods. It was about dealing with the Israelites. Lifting up your hand in an oath. So when you do this whole thing, I swear that actually has ancient uh, roots to it. Ezekiel 20 verse 5. You shall say to them, thus said the Mastiah, on the day when I chose Yisrael and lifted my hand in an oath to the seed of the house of Yaakov, I made myself known to them in the land of Mitzrayim. I lifted my hand in an oath to them, saying, I am Yah, your Elohim. Now... You've probably noticed, I don't know if you can see it, but in an oath I've, had, I've italicized, because it's not in the Hebrew. 
This is one of the times, though, that the translators, I believe, have done something correct, like because they're giving you the meaning. It literally, Beyom uh, Bahari, in the day that I selected in Israel, actually, it says, not not the day I selected Israel, the day I selected in Israel, which is really interesting. Ve'isa, so this is the word there, Isa yadi, I will lift up my hand. Isa is the uh, future conjugation of Nasa to the seed of the house of Jacob. And again here, uh, Va'isa yadi lehem, and I will lift my hand to them. This is, I, for the sake of time, you can look at this yourself, but again, here in Ezekiel 20, in an oath, it's been supplemented by the translators, and they've done this correctly. Here, I lifted my, also lifted my hand in an oath, inserted, to them in the wilderness. Now listen to what he says, not to bring them into the land which I had given to them, flowing with milk and honey, the splendor of all the lands. So this lifting of the hand, quote unquote, in an oath, again, the Hebrew d doesn't have, where is it, in an oath. Vigamani nasati yadi. So, and also I raised my hand to them. So, how are the translators able to put in an oath? Before we get to that, though, why? Because they rejected right ruling, did not walk in my laws, they profaned my Sabbaths, the heart went after their idols. You could argue they took his name in vain. This is where it comes from. Deuteronomy 134, Yah heard the voice of your words and was wroth and took an oath, saying, so here the word for and took an oath is uh, vayi shavah, shavah means to swear. It's also the root for the number seven. What did he make an oath? Not one of these evil generate men of this evil generation shall see the good of the land which I swore to your fathers, except Kalev, son of Yefuneh, he shall see it, and to him and his children I give the land which he walked, because he followed Yah completely. I bring this up because even though in Ezekiel it said it's supplementing the word in an oath, here it's telling you that Yah actually did take an oath. He swore. So this is how we know that to lift the hand to someone means to make an oath. And again, this practice has survived even into our modern society. You put your hand up and you take an oath. And it would have been your right hand, because your right hand, symbol of strength, authority. So you can lift your hand in an oath. What do you use to make an oath? Words. You lift your voice to make an oath. So something is happening in your heart. You've made a decision somewhere between your heart and your mind. You lift your hand idiomatically and then you lift your words to it. Now what does Yeshua have to say about making oaths? Better not to if you're not going to keep them, right? The majority of oaths in scripture start with as Yah lives. As Yah lives. Whose name are you now bringing into disrepute when you make an oath and don't keep it? His. So this is why lifting up the hand, lifting up the voice, making oath, is all connected to taking his name in vain. This goes as far as saying, you know when Yah said this and he didn't say? We'll get to that. Revelation 10.5, and the messenger whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his right hand to the heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever. Now, this is written in Greek originally, but again, I believe this is evidence of Hebraic speech underlying the Greek translation. So we see this, lifting up the hand to swear an oath. Now, in Deuteronomy 10, 20 and 21, it says, Fear Yah your Elohim, serve him, cling to him, and swear by his name. We're actually commanded to do it. He says, do it. However, the problem is that as time went on, 
people started to take his name in vain. Swear by his name. Isaiah 48, hear this, O house of Yaakov, who are called by the name of Yisrael, and have come from the waters of Yehuda, who swear by the name of Yah, and profess the Elohim of Yisrael, though not in truth or in righteousness. And this is where it gets convicting, because I believe that not only are we all guilty of this at some point, in some fashion, and we're praise the Father, I believe we're starting to try and come out of that, but I believe this is where vast proportions of the body is. They swear by his name, they profess the name of the Elohim of Israel, yet they bring his name into the mud. For they call themselves after the set-apart city and lean on the Elohim of Israel, Yar of hosts is his name. Because I knew that you were hard, your neck was an iron sinew, your forehead was bronze. Therefore I declared it to you long ago. Before it came, I made you hear, lest you say, my idol has done them, and my carved image and my molded image commanded them. You are saying, essentially, I only told you these things ahead of time because I knew you would try and give my glory to your idols. And when you do that, you take my name in vain, because you're supposed to be my people. For my name's sake. So this is how you know it's to deal with his name. So no, in fact, nowhere here are they using Elohim's name as a cuss word, aren't they? In fact, they're professing it. They're blessing themselves with it. They're swearing oaths by it. But it's their actions, namely spiritual adultery, and stealing his glory and applying it to someone else, that desecrates his name. Which now means that taking his name in vain, the ability to do it, is just widened. For my name's sake I postponed my displeasure, and for my praise I held it back from you, so as to not cut you off. See, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have chosen you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake, I do it. For how is it profaned? And my esteem I do not give to another. The how it is profaned is linking back to his name's sake. So by our actions, his name was being profaned. We were taking his name in vain, is what Yah is saying. Now this has been aimed at Judah, by the way. But there's nothing new under the sun. So you can claim faith. You can claim the name. You can say all these wonderful things. You can make oaths and vows in his name. And then we just drag his name through the mud. It's like, I see people, they have a struggle in the flesh, and they'll make a vow that they won't do this, and they think that because they've made a vow, it's going to make it easier. Guess what? It makes it ten times harder. Because you now have the temptation added to it. Making, saying some magical words isn't going to change it. And the problem is, people will make their vows, and lo and behold, you've taken his name in vain when you broke it. You're using his name as if it's cheap. Prophetic word. Let's look at this. Jeremiah 17. I, I, oh, I'm going to get excited. Thus said Yah, guard yourselves and bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem. The word for burden is Masa. Masa is part of the word family of Nasa. Which means, so Nasa means to lift, to carry. Masa is the thing, the burden which you are carrying. Nor take a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, nor do any work. And you shall set apart the Sabbath day as I commanded your fathers. But they did not obey or incline their ear, and they made their next step so as to not hear and receive instruction. What's that got to do with taking his name in vain? You're probably asking. Ah, let's look at this word masab. It's how the word burden is used throughout scripture that's very interesting. The message of the word of Yah to Israel by Malachi or Malachi. 
The Hebrew, however, says masa, masa devar Yah. So the burden of the word of Yah. El Yisrael to Israel, beyad malachi by the hand of Malachi. So the, the, the English is just complete. Is, they've, they've translated the meaning, but they've missed the, the literal and the idiomatic expression. It's literally saying the burden of the word of Elohim, of the word of Yah to Israel by the hand of Malachi. So we, we've just been talking about lifting your voice, lifting your hand, that both these can be done for good or for evil. So I just find it interesting, the burden of the word of Yah, the prophetic word. Proverbs 31.1, the words of sovereign Lemuel, a message which his mother taught him. Sounds pretty, right, pretty cool. Again, we miss so much in the Hebrew. As in the English, sorry, we gain it in the Hebrew. Divrei Lemuel Melech, so the words of Lemuel the king, Masa, Asher Yisrato Imo, so that his mother taught him, but it's the burden that his mother taught him, not the message, it's the burden. Now, hear this word, Yisrato, it comes from the word Yasar, it actually means to chastise with blows, thus it means to instruct, so it makes more sense to it being a burden or a yoke if it's there for your chastisement. Chastisement is there to grow you up and mature you. See, this, you should now be thinking Yeshua's words, my burden is light. But the, so the Hebrew is masa. So literally the words of Sovereign Lemuel, the burden or a burden with which his mother chastised him. And then you read these proverbs. And we know that the Proverbs and the Scripture are there for our reproof. Oh wait, chastisement. Now, what's really interesting, again, think this is burden. Like, the, what I'm trying to say is that the word burden can be something you carry. It can also be an oratory. And that oratory here is telling you that it's actually there to chastise you and to reprove you. This is why you have to bear it. Isaiah 13.1, the message concerning Babel or Babylon, which Yeshayahu son of Amot saw, guess what? <laughs> it's not the message, it's the burden. Masa Babel, Asher Chazah, so the burden of Babylon that saw Yeshayahu, so that Isaiah saw Ben Amot, so it's the burden. The prof now, when you read it, it's a prophetic word which is there to chastise Babylon and pronounce judgment on them. And this word, Masa, being used within the prophetic sense, in all those references in Isaiah, you see this over, you know, the message concerning the Red Sea or the message concerning the desert. It's actually the burden. Uh, King James actually uses the word. Yeah, it does. But the thing is, if you don't, if you don't understand that the word burden comes from the word nasa, and you don't understand how this, the broad range of the words, a burden, when you read it in English, makes no sense. Let me ask this: whose burden? Is it Isaiah's burden? Whose is it? It's Elohim's burden, I believe. Oh wait, Elohim is sharing his burden with a prophet. Hmm, interesting. And so, how do we know it's Elohim's burden? Does Yah enjoy the death of the sinner. No, he doesn't, does he not? 
Parents, do you enjoy chastising your children? If you, if you do, you've got issues. Do you see, like, Yard doesn't want to chastise. He doesn't want to have to judge. But sometimes you've got to chastise. Sometimes you've got to lay the Torah down. You have to punish. By no means leave. He says forgiving, but by no means leaving unpunished. Why? Because the punishment is there for your refinement. So Yah has this burden. And he's saying to the prophet, go and say this to the people. If you, and essentially, in all of these, it's basically saying judgment is coming because you did not repent. Usually because of spiritual adultery. Same message over and over. And I believe what you're seeing is Yah has this burden that he's having to discipline those and judge those that he would prefer they repent for their own good. Therefore, he shares his burden with a prophet. And the prophet is the messenger of that. We never think, we always think, you know, sharing each other's burdens. We don't think of Elohim sharing his burden with us. Love should be a two-way stream. Problem is, actually, before we get to that, Revelation 14, I looked and saw a lamb standing on Mount Zion with him, 144,000, having his father's name written upon their foreheads. Wow, they're not taking it in vain. They're not taking it in vain. How? They are those who are not defiled with women. So I believe this, this is, I don't believe this is literal. I believe in speaking of their spiritual virgins. As Paul would say, I want to present you a spiritual virgin to Messiah. For they are maidens. They are those, think that the ten virgins, you know, five foolish, five wise. They are those following the Lamb wherever he leads them on. They were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to Elohim and the Lamb. So we know they've got no spiritual adultery. In their mouth was found no falsehood. For they are blameless before the throne of Elohim. The King James will use guile here. Now, why am I bringing this up? I believe to be a prophet of Yah, you cannot have falsehood or guile coming in your heart because your mouth will speak from the overflow. A prophet is not a diviner of the future. A prophet is simply a mouthpiece. I believe that Yah is sharing his burden with the prophet and saying, go say this. Here's the problem. Do we have an ability to take the words of Yah and then twist them? And this is why the prophet cannot have guile. Because you will twist the words of the living Elohim. The words for falsehood in here, uh, or guile, is the word dolos. Craft, deceit, guile, a trick, or to bait someone, or wile. This is word is used also in this passage, Mark chapter 7. He said, what comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil reasonings, adulteries, whorings, murders, thefts, greedy desires, wickedness, deceit, guile, indecency, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these wicked matters come from within and defile a man. If we have guile or we twist the words of Elohim in, in this particular instance, but we have any of this going on, Yah's not going to share his burden with you. Let me put it that way. Why? Because you won't be able to be trusted with it. Have you ever opened up to someone about something you're going through or you're sharing your burden with them and uh, they crap on you from a great height? How does that feel? It doesn't feel good, does it? It really doesn't. And then as a result of that, we become distrustful. Elohim has feelings too. I just think he's a lot wiser than what we are. He doesn't just give out his stuff just like that. This is why he conceals matters. And it's to the glory of kings to seek those matters out. Those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will find these things. They will find, sorry, the, the character of Elohim, which includes his burdens. 
Matthew 12, 33, either make the tree good and its, tree, its fruit good, or else make the tree rotten and its fruit rotten, for a tree is known by its fruit. So what comes out of your mouth, what you lift your voice to, what you lift your hand to, Brood of adders, how are you able to speak what is good, being wicked? For the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. The good man brings forth what is good from the good treasures of his heart. And the wicked man brings forth what is wicked from the wicked treasures. And I say to you that for every idle word men speak, they shall give an account of it in the day of judgment. Why? Because your words expose your heart. For by your words... By your heart condition, you will be declared righteous. And by your words or your heart condition, you will be declared unrighteous. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For they do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather the grapes from a bramble bush. Again, the good man brings forth what is good out of the good treasure of his heart. The wicked man brings forth what is wicked out of the wicked treasure of his heart. But out of the overflow of the heart, his mouth speaks. But why do you call me master, master, and do not do what I say? Does this have overtones of master, master, did we not do all these things in your name? I do not know you. But they were doing it in his name. Oh, wait. They took it in vain by their actions, what they lifted their mouths to, what they lifted their hands to. Everyone who is coming to me and is hearing my words and is doing them, I shall show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. I mean, huge messianic illusions. And when a flood came and a stream burst against that house, but was unable to break it, or shake it, for it was founded upon the rock. And Paul would say that Messiah is the rock. But the one hearing and not doing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation, against, this, with, against which the stream burst, and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. The point that I'm trying to bring out is when you thread all this together, you'll realize that we can claim to know him. But we can the whole time we can claim to know him, follow him, and the whole time we're taking his name in vain. And as a result of that, he will not trust us. He will love us, but he won't trust us. Again, parents, are they are kids that you trust more than other kids. It's a rhetorical, don't make them feel bad, but you know. Especially the less mature, the younger they are, generally the, the less they can be, well, I don't know, I'll take that back. <laughs> I couldn't be trusted as far as I could be thrown as a teenager. <laughs> but you get the point. Maturity should, bring tr should breed trust. And if our king cannot trust us, why would he be intimate with us? Jeremiah 23, 25, I've heard, that, remember we're talking about the prophetic word here. What the prophets have said who prophesy falsehood in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. So when shall it be in the heart of the prophets? The prophets of falsehood and the prophets of the deceit of their own heart. So these prophets are deluded. Who try to make my people forget my name by their dreams, which everyone relates to his neighbor, as their fathers forgot my name for Baal. So they're now taking his name in vain. They're bringing it to naught. The prophet who has a dream, let him relate the dream. And he who has my word, let him speak my word in truth. So notice here, like we, it's about speaking the unadulterated word of truth here. What is the chaff to the wheat, declares Yah. Essentially Yah saying, let them speak, eventually they'll be found out. Is not my word like a fire, declares Yah, and like a hammer that shatters a rock? Therefore see, I am against the prophets, declares Yah, who steal my words, everyone from his neighbor. Notice they're not stealing the, 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 the epic of Gilgamesh or the, the Hindu Sanskrit writings. No, they're stealing Yah's words. 
which means they've got them in the first place. See, I am against a prophet, declares Yah, who use their tongues and say, he declares. They're lifting up their voice, and we're going to see they're doing it in the name of Yah. See, I am against those who prophesy false dreams, declares Yah, and relate them and lead my people astray by their falsehoods and by their reckless boasting. But I myself did not send them, nor have I commanded them, and they do not profit this people at all, declares Yah. And when the people, or the prophet, or the priests ask you, saying, What is the message of Baal? Nimrod? No. What is the message of Yah? And again, it's what is the burden of Yah? So here it's understood that the word burden is actually a prophetic oratory. Because you know, the people are going to Jeremiah here. Yah is saying, Jeremiah, when these people come to you and they say, what's the burden of Yah? Then you shall say to them, what message? I shall forsake you, declares Yah. Why? Because they've been taking his name in vain. As for the prophet and the priest and the people who say the burden, the message of Yah, I shall punish that man and his house. What was going on was that Jeremiah is basically saying Babylon is going to take you all and kill you. Basically, you will be judged. And the prophets were prophesying peace, peace, peace. Very much like the bitter, you know, I have peace, though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart. We're told to pluck up bitter roots, lest they infect the whole body. And I believe this is why Yah had to judge his people. It had become rotten, it had become bitterness, it had become wormwood. This is why in Isaiah it says, Yah is saying, I planted a vineyard, I did everything right, and it just, the, the wine came out bitter. Why? What happened? So he has to yank it all out and start over. But notice who whose name they're prophesying in. This is what each one says to his neighbor and each one to his brother. What has Yah answered and what has Yah spoken? Man, are we living this today? Nothing new under the sun. Many people saying, what has Yah said? Chasing every prophetic, every, uh, you know, um, sensationalized spiritual warfare nonsense. What has Yah answered? Oh, I felt it in my heart. I'm going to say something really bold here. If Yah speaks to you, there's no doubt. You're not going, oh, I felt it. You're knocked back. It, it will actually, uh, what's the word? It will disturb you when Yah truly speaks to you. Believe me. It's not that, it's, I'm not picking on people. I, I just, people get emotional and they think that their emotions equal Elohim. Elohim can make you emotional, but that doesn't mean your emotions are Elohim, if that makes sense. Remember that earlier it said that this, they're prophesying from the deceit of their own heart, which is where your emotions are at. But the message of Yah you no longer remember, even though you're asking for it. For every man's message is his own word. Every time you see message, the word is burden, oratory, uh, prophetic word. For you have changed the words of the living Elohim, Yah of hosts, our Elohim. You've changed it. And here we are today, the words of the living Elohim. Everyone is reading the same book, but man, are people coming to different understandings. The word has been changed. And everyone is creating Elohim into their own image. Well, actually, no, this is what he says. This is why it's amazing how Elohim sounds just like you in your heart's desire. You are taking his name in vain. This is what you say to the prophet. What has Yah answered you and what has Yah spoken? But since you say the message of Yah, therefore thus said Yah, because you say this word, the message of Yah, and I have sent you saying, do not say the message of Yah. Like, again, the amount of self-appointed so-called prophets that there are today, oh, 
oh, I think I'm a prophet. I felt it. Did you know that every prophet didn't want the office in Scripture? Jeremiah actually gave up for a brief period. That's the office of a prophet. I don't want to do it anymore. Why? Because it's a burden. Therefore, see, I shall utterly forget you and cast you away from my presence, along with the city that I gave you and your fathers. I believe this is speak of not being allowed into the wedding feast. You will not see the face of the king. I don't believe this is um, da eternal damnation, second death. At the very least, though, you will not see the king's face. Why? You've been taking his name in vain the whole time. And I shall put an everlasting reproach on you and an everlasting shame that is not forgotten. It will... This is why there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Think of the least in the kingdom. You know, greatest, least? Well, the least, they've got reproach. All of that to say you do not bring, lift, Nassar, the name of Yah your Elohim to naught. Why? Because Yah does not leave the one unpunished who brings his name to naught. So again, Nassar means a lot more than to lift or bear. The, when you walk around, you have the name of Yah on you. How are you carrying it? How, what witness are you bearing? This is why I say when people want to start wearing zizis, be very careful. Because now you, you are literally wearing his name, if you want to call it that. People are watching you. They may not be asking you, but they're watching you. And if you're going to lift his, carry your, his name on your, on your tongue, if you're going to lift your hand to action, what are you going to do? Let's finish with this. Hear the voice of my prayers when I cry to you, when I lift up, Nassar, my hands toward your set-apart speaking place. So we are to lift our hands. I believe, I, I believe it's speaking idiomatically here. 1 Timothy 2.8, so I resolve that the men pray everywhere, lifting up hands that are set apart without wrath and disputing. Again, like, remember that what we say, what we do, is are we bringing a good, um, a good witness? And as part of our prayer life, because here this is speaking of, you could argue your prayer life, your prayer closet, Again, are we the nagging wife in Elohim's ear? Are we the dripping tap? Constantly, I want, I this, da 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 da, yak, 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 yak. Talk is cheap. Actions, however. I hope that at least jostles you and starts to make you think deeper about what it means to take his name in vain. Next week, we're going to look at actually how this idea of carrying, bearing, is actually linked with sin and bringing sin and reproach upon his tabernacle, which, by the way, we are. Part three will be about restoration. Like I said, this word, Nassar, you've got the whole plan of redemption right in there. Let's stop here. Amen.